Hello, welcome. It's really nice to see you all and have you all here this evening. My name is Chris. I'm a bookseller at Boswell. I have a few introductory things before we get started to tell you. First of all, today is day, I wrote it down, 4,262 that Boswell has been a bookstore and been in business. I'm thrilled to welcome Rufi Thorpe here. Um, let me go through the biographical details, right? Uh, author of three novels um, and did an MFA from the U of Virginia, I believe, right? Yep. Um, I got it right. And um, let me tell you, wrote uh, Girls from Corona Del Mar, which is long listed for the uh, International Dylan Thomas Prize and the uh, Flaherty Dunn First Novel Prize, wrote Dear Fang with Love and wrote The Knockout Queen, which if you don't know by now, my absolute favorite book of the year. Um, it is so good that when I finished this book, I went back, immediately read your other two novels. Um, and at some point in the Zoom, just kind of warning everyone now, I'm definitely going to be like really gushy about this book. It's going to get uncomfortable <laughs> for everybody. Um, so just like bear with me now. But let me just say before we get started, I, um, you know, I did a little staff recommendation um, to talk about how excited I am about the book. Uh, and so what I said about the novel is that uh, to me, a big part of it is about examining morality. How do you judge a person's moment at the edge? How do you put it into context? Um, but then in the novel, those questions are really put into sharp relief when they're juxtaposed against the book's uh, numbing understanding that no matter what they do, the generation these characters are part of is probably gonna end up worse than the one before them. Does it matter if their futures are dashed? What you have left in the book are a couple of kids clinging to each other uh, to whom Thorpe has given the enviable, pitiable, beautiful, ugly depth of real, living, breathing human beings. Are they moral? Who cares? They are alive. So please give Ruby Thorpe a very nice internet warm clapping welcome. And hello, Hi. welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Did you know? Okay, so they sent me that when you wrote it. I don't know. Did you know this? That they get like sent to the yeah, author, totally. and and I burst into tears. And I thought it was oh, like no. such a better description of the book than I had ever. I'm really bad at the elevator pitch. <laughs> it's not it's not a strength. And I was like, how how? And now I've learned how to describe this book from you. Well, that's incredibly kind. Um, and a perfect segue into my first question, which is, will you give us the elevator pitch for your book? I will. <laughs> um, it, it's always kind of a hard one because the very first plot point is kind of a spoiler. So I like to just start with the characters because it's a very character driven book. So it's about the story of the friendship between um, Bunny and Michael. And Bunny is, you know, six foot three um, by the end of high school, just sort of a giant test. She's a volleyball player. Her dad is a star real estate agent, hot shot kind of in the town and um, Michael is her next door neighbor and he has moved to the town North Shore after his mom is sent to prison. And he is very cerebral and an A student and works at Rite Aid after school and has a secret grinder account. And um, you wouldn't think that they have anything in common but they kind of have everything in common and they're able to be um, their unfiltered selves with each other. Um, and then Bunny does something really bad. And so it becomes about how do you, how do you, what do you do with all of your impulses? You know, what happens when you love someone you wish you didn't love and when you did something you didn't mean to do? Um, and that's those kind of like questions about how to, how to love someone who's done something bad are kind of central to the book. Absolutely. Um, I think you're totally right, too. For me, it's very much so much character driven. I mean, you would know. But um, also, it's so much the voice. Michael's the narrator of the book. Um, and I was hoping maybe, uh, well, I'll tell everyone, because um, we were talking before and saying, would you read a page or two? And you said, I don't like to read the opening, which to me, I, I was like, what? Um, because the in the first you had me in the first paragraph when the narrator refers to essentially the invasion of Iraq as what a whoopsie. Um, <laughs> you hooked me then, and I was with you the whole way. Um, so, would you mind kind of giving us Michael's voice for a couple paragraphs? Just read for a minute or two. Yeah, I mean, I can read from the opening too. I don't know why I like didn't want to. Um, okay, I'm I'm gonna. 
I'm going to read a little bit about Bunny's dad, actually, because then at least we get him and he winds up being kind of another major character in the book. Um, the gossip about Bunny's father was that he drank too much and specifically that he was a regular at the Blue Lagoon, a tiki bar tucked a few blocks off Main Street, though he was what was referred to as a good drunk, beloved for his willingness to spring for pizza at two in the morning and listen to the tragic stories of other adult men, sad adult men. There was further supposition that his incredible success as a real estate agent was due to his habit of frequenting drinking holes, making friends with anybody and everybody. Having spent ye many years observing their recycling bin, I can attest that such a justification would be a bit economical with the truth. Ray Lampert was turning his birthday into a lifestyle, to quote Drake. Each week there would be two or three large gin bottles and then seven or eight wine bottles, all of the same make a mid-shelf Cabernet. Perhaps he bought them in bulk. It was difficult to imagine him shopping, wheeling a cart filled with nothing but Cabernet and gin through the Costco. How did someone with such an obvious drinking problem go about keeping themselves supplied? Or rather, how did a rich person do it? In my experience, addiction was messy. A pastiche of what you bought on payday as a treat and what you bought on other days convinced you wouldn't buy anything, then suddenly finding yourself at the liquor store smiling bravely like it was all okay. What did the cashier at the 7-Eleven make of my own father? Did he note on what days my father bought two tall boys and on what days he bought the fifth of cheap bourbon as well? And did he keep a mental tally of whether he was getting better or worse like I did? Or did everyone buy that kind of thing at 7-Eleven? Perhaps my father was so unremarkable in his predilections as to avoid detection at all. And what was happening to the children of all those other men, buyers of beef jerky and vodka, peanuts and wine? What did a 7-Eleven even sell that wasn't designed to kill you one way or another? So I'll stop there. Perfect, and a totally fair question too, <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, wow. Um, for me, the, the experience of reading this book, uh, it's really, really funny, and it's also kind of punch you in the chest all the time, back and forth and back and forth. And you draw us really, really close to these characters. In fact, I was talking about it with another bookseller who read it, who said to me, like, I didn't know people wrote characters that felt this real. Um, so I, I, it's just one of the best kind of immersive reading experiences. So I, I'm curious, what's the other side of that like for you? Um, maybe get us into this. Just what was the experience of writing the book like for you? Um, well, okay, so Bunny has been in my head for a very, very long time. Um, when I was like 18 in college, I was at a party in Brooklyn and there was this girl boxer there who had either like maybe she was on drugs or really drunk or maybe it was like brain damage, but she kept forgetting where she was and having to, she had this kind of creepy little boyfriend who kept having to explain to her where they were and when they were going home. And she got like stuck in the bathroom at one point and like broke the sink is the main thing that I remember. I did not know this girl's name. I didn't know anything about her. We didn't have a conversation, but she just stuck in my head. Um, and I just kept thinking about her. And I think like it's the, in some ways it's the dream of having physical power. And so that this idea of this giant test of this like physically powerful woman who's able to accidentally break sinks and rip them out of the wall. Um, has been, I've been thinking about that, you know, for over a decade. Michael was, and I kept trying to write it. I had the idea for this story and I kept trying to write it from Bunny's point of view and it wasn't working. She has no sense of irony <laughs> and she, she couldn't understand what was going on. She was just sort of experiencing it all as pain and not really giving any of the layers that I that I wanted to explore in the story. So I knew I needed a focalizer character, you know, like um, Gatsby can't tell the great Gatsby. Sophie can't tell Sophie's choice. Like sometimes those larger than life characters, like you have to let somebody else tell it. And so I knew that I needed that. And it was literally as dumb as I was sitting. I like to write like laying down on my sofa by the, the windows in my living room so I can keep an eye on the crows. And I was like, I looked out the window and I was like, what if, what if she had a neighbor? And I mean, it was that dumb of an idea. And then when I started writing him, it was like explosive, like his voice just came. 
And so whenever that happens, I think, oh, well, this is clearly a deeply repressed aspect of self. <laughs> like, I think some writers often experience it as channeling or something like that, where, where suddenly you, you don't even know where it's all coming from. But it, it was very clear that he like started dragging parts of my own biography into the book. And he was mean in a way that I would never let myself be mean and therefore funny in a way that I would never let myself be funny. And um, he was a lot of fun to write. Yeah, I think you've answered a lot of my next question because I want to talk about my <laughs> um, and the voice. I love it so much. So we did um, a, a print interview a while back when the book first came out. And something you said I, that always struck me about it was that um, life has always struck you as so sad and funny at the same time and Michael's the same way. Um, and I love that. I love so much how you captured that intersection of sad, funny, um, you've given Michael throughout the book to kind of a historical awareness that, you know, is, is very huge. Um, and so I, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, I'm wondering too, I, that another part of Michael, his, his sexuality is a huge part of the book. Um, you know, he's, he starts using, I actually, I love the description in the book of his, he starts with Craigslist, gets a phone, moves on to Grindr, and he's hooking up with much older men, decades older men. Um, and there's the obvious power imbalances there that are at play. And I think that's fascinating because that's one of the central themes to me of the book as a whole too. Um, and I'm curious, what made you want to explore that world with Michael too? Because that's so much of what he brings to the world of the book. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I knew that I wanted the book to be about violence. I, I, that was sort of like the start of it was female violence was like the, the premise. And um, I, Michael just kept bringing sex into it. And it was, you, it, so I'm bisexual and I spent a long time like pretending that I wasn't. And I would meet girls online and have sex with them. And it didn't count because it wasn't relationships. I was, it was really horrible. It was like a, a, a very um, like long road to uh, self-realization for me. And so I, he kept sort of bringing in like this, I, the, these trysts and this idea of this sort of like secret other life that you're having where you're having these very intense physical relationships with strangers. And it was and then that I sort of realized like, oh, like both violence and sex are just different forms of touching. Like they're both just like specialized forms of the ways that we touch each other. And, and then I kind of understood that there, that I, I needed to talk about both of them. And so then I um, sort of let all of that come into the book and, um, and see how it would all, so much of being a novelist, I feel like is finding one thing and then you find, an, it's like being a collector and you find another thing. You're like, I think these two things have something to do together. And then you kind of keep, building the collection and until all of the echoes sort of build into a way that like makes meaning or something. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's fascinating too that he's, you know, he's so aware of himself early on and then that lets him get into situations where he can be so unaware of the world around him and the power dynamics going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so I, I also, we should also of course talk about Bunny some too. Um, funny, I mean, right? Um, the Princess of North Shore, you introduce her the first time we ever see her, which I love because um, she's still, she's such an outsider in North Shore, right? In, in a really exceptional ways. Um, so we talked a little, you talked a little bit about it. Uh, high school volleyball star, an Olympic hopeful. Um, and I love that she's this outsider because she's exceptional rather than for being a weirdo or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of that is, of course, that she's a physically powerful person, um, capable of destruction. And um, in some other interviews, you know, you were talking about you wanted to write about this. Um, so I'm curious, what what is it about Bunny? And you touched on this a little bit. What What is it that you really love about her? And or maybe even also, what is it you hate about her? <sighs> well, OK, so I think that um, I. I was the only child of a single mother and we lived with my grandmother. And so I grew up in this world of women and I knew that men were like physically stronger. And that was a thing. Like I knew that they had their own categories in the Olympics and everything, but I didn't think they were that much stronger. And like, because I was like the young strong one, I was always like, 
the one lifting heavy things for I was the man of our house like anything that it that a man needed to do was was going to be my job and so um it was really like a shock when I had like my first physical altercation with a man to realize like I I wasn't even really going to be able to slow him down if he wanted to kill me like it, the power imbalance was so great I mean I I was beat in arm wrestling by my 15 year old nephew at Christmas like you know, you know what I mean like it's um, there's just no comparison and it always frustrated me and I, I wanted to be physically powerful and I um, I thought that I was going to be tall because I was really tall as a child and then I just like stopped growing in fifth grade and I've been that, <laughs> that size ever since um, and so I, I had this image of like the giantess sort of that I could have been um, but with that power also comes the responsibility that like you can really hurt people um, and as a woman I have often been very grateful that it's not my responsibility to ever punch someone because they're rude or whatever like I don't <laughs> no one is expecting me to be able to to do that and I've always been grateful because um, it seems very scary and hard so I think that <laughs> that <laughs> The bunny is very much like a wish fulfillment character and also an experiment. I like to write about things that I don't have a set opinion about. I feel like if you have uh, your mind already made up about something, then the book becomes just a diorama proving your point. And since you're the one making up all the rules, you're jerry-rigging the whole thing to support whatever your point of view is. So I like to write things about things that I have deeply conflicted feelings about and that I don't know the answers to and I don't know what I think and um, so I think that that's part of the reason that like, I'm very drawn to violence and very scared of it. Yeah absolutely. Um, gosh there's two things in there I really want to talk about. I'll talk about the one thing about Bunny I want to talk about. First um, and you said you know you're hesitant to judge it or really curious about judging her and her actions um, and I think that's one of the fascinating ways you frame her story in the novel is that we don't see her interior that much, you know, so much of the judgment of her actions. Um, and yes, I saw the comment in here, don't give the Indian away, so we won't give the Indian away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Um, but, you know, so much about it is other people placing a value judgment on her, placing a judgment on her actions. Um, the focus of the gaze is everyone else focusing the gaze on her. Um, I'm curious how you see that gaze, but then I'm also curious, like, how do you see Bunny looking back out at it? What, what is she thinking too? Yeah, I mean, I really wanted kind of to have that layer of like the awareness of the town. And that's part of why I wanted like this small insular community so that those opinions of like their neighbors and the kids in there, there's no escaping it. You know, it's, there's no just being anonymous. And especially because she is so tall, like everybody knows her, she sticks out. Yeah. Um, and so I think that um, so much of the questions about like how you um, perform your gender are also questions of how are people receiving your performance and you're always using um, your physicality and your actions and your voice to send signals to other people and to you know society at large and um, and so that layer was really important to me. But there's also like pretty early on a uh, murder in the town um, that becomes sort of this like frame kind of um, of Donna Morse and um, domestic violence is like another theme throughout the book because um, Michael's mother uh, went to prison for stabbing his father. And so what I really just wanted was chances to see all different kinds of violence and as it's received in different social circles and so I wanted those conversations between Bunny and Michael those intimate ones of trying to understand Donna Morse's murder I wanted the high school's reaction when everybody kind of shuns Bunny and is being judgmental about her and just the sort of viciousness of high school um, and the the smallness and how big a deal sometimes very little things can can suddenly become um, and so that was really my goal was to sort of try and fit in as many different um, different sides of the of the coin kind of.
Yeah, no, I, I think you're very successful. It's, it's a many faceted coin, um, for sure. Uh, looking at that, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What, a coin just, only has two sides, and it was like such a bad, <laughs> such a bad. Let's just roll with the bad coin metaphor. Show with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, speaking of violence, and you, you touched on this a little bit, and I think it's such a huge part of the book. Um, and actually, I, so like I said, I went back and I read your other two books. I think it's a huge part of your work. I'm fascinated by this. Um, oh man, there's so many things. I think one of the big things is that you treat it with such a casualness in a lot of your writing, um, a, a matter of fact way. And I think a lot of that to me, and again, this is as a heterosis dude reading it, but reads as just a very matter of fact understanding of the ever presence of violence in women's lives um, throughout history. So I'm curious, particularly in this book, but then if you want to talk about it, even your books as a whole, um, you know, the relationship of your writing and violence, both immediate, large, I'll let you take it away. Um, well, I think so in my own family, I was sort of like the fairy tales that I was raised on were the stories of my mother's childhood and her parents were just like the worst people. Like it was like an Edward Albee play in there, like every night they were alcoholics and they were abusive and um, it was really scary. But so, so those stories and trying to understand how people could do that and um, like even I, like why do people want to have sex with little kids like why <laughs> you know the, this was like a puzzle that was very much part of my coming uh to moral awareness as I became kind of a teenager and um a young adult and so I think that those questions of not only like why do people do bad things but what do you do with them once they've done the bad things you know like my mom still loved her dad, even though he was horrible. And it, it, you, it's just not clean and it's not easy. And um, I guess it's interesting because I get a lot that um, my work has a lot of darkness in it. And I think part of it's because I choose to write about things that I haven't made up my mind about. Um, and like, you know, I've made up my mind that like love is nice, like, you know, romantic love or whatever. Like there's lots of things that are not troubling to me. So the fact that I want to write about the things that trouble me is part of why there's so much darkness. But, um, I also just think that a lot of these issues are ever present and I don't really know a single family whose life is completely untouched by, addiction or um, domestic violence or even just like emotional abuse, like whatever, whatever um, way we, we hurt the people that we love a lot of times. And I don't think even if it's not always talked about, and maybe I talk about it in a casual way, like I think that it's, um, I think it's a common human experience. Yeah, for sure. Maybe casual is not the right word, but um blunt matter of fact you know yeah yeah um, and I think too you, you know you touched on something that I, I think is really fascinating with this book specifically is so much of it is about at the after the fact of violence and the interrogating of the morality after those moments I mean there's you know almost immediately in the I, I'm not going to say what it is but there's a violent act in the book and almost immediately after there's this interior look of who has the right to judge this person and their moment at the edge um, mm -hmm. and I, I'm curious, how did that become such a central question for the book? I've just always been so upset by the idea of punishment. I, it doesn't like, it seems so obvious, like you, a person says something bad, you have to do something. And so I, I very much understand the, the idea of punishment. And yet it seems like very ineffective <laughs> as a way of actually like fixing a situation. Um, you know, I think to the the California prison system in particular is really, I mean, there's just, it's a huge prison population. And um, the three strikes law was just really deeply unfortunate. Um, and so I think 
an awareness of um, basically how stupid I thought prison was, and especially imprisoning people for, you know, um, non-violent offenses, although I realize this is a violent one. Um, but I think that that was very much part of my awareness. And I, again, though, it's not part of the reason it fascinates me is because it's not like I'm, you can't not punish people. Like you can't just let people, um, you know, do illegal things. And so it's this really, um, this yucky place where you kind of have to play both parts of it. Like you, you have to forgive the person that you love and you have to hold them responsible. Um, and you have to um, punish people and accept that the punishment is, um, is not fixing anything. Um, and, you know, Michael also is sort of at one point in the book, the recipient of some violence and has very mixed feelings about what he thinks should happen or what, you know, what do you really, what does justice look like from the point of view of the victim? You know, what do they actually want? Like what would feel right? Um, and it's hardly ever what you get. Yeah, I think that's actually a moment I have marked out in the book, right, right after Michael, the character, is kind of a victim of violence, he immediately backs out and almost takes this historical perspective and, like, is, like, looking at mm. acts of violence throughout history, you know, and essentially saying, where does mine fall on the scale? At least to a degree, that's how I read it. Um, and I think, I too, have, well, go ahead. <laughs> I have, like, so one of my obsessions is, I think, um, like, Roman culture <laughs> and um, just trying to understand like what kind of animals we are. Like there is this like, I mean, we all know about like gladiators and um, making people fight wild animals and everything, but they would, it was so ornate and so sadistic. And like they had this one where they would take convicts and tie them to either end of really, really, really long, tall teeter totters. And then like so, so set up all these teeter totters with people tied to them and then like send in a bunch of hungry animals so that you had to like push up to, and then that would send your partner down and you were trying to fight over who would get eaten kind of. Um, and it has always seemed to me like we're just really only a tiny bit away from that. And that at any point it could just flip back <laughs> to being that. Um, and that, that, um, like, I guess the older I got and the more that I learned about life and about people, the more convinced I became that, um, like goodness and kindness is not something like natural and native to people, but something we have to fight to protect that, like those ideals of decency and, um, you know, mercy and kindness. And like that whole love thy neighbor thing, like that's, that's, you know, something you have to hold tight to. And it's not something that you can afford to sort of let go of. I realize I've wandered fairly far away from the book at this point. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, I mean, well, I have a question that's further down and I actually have it labeled as the bleak question. And I think this is the moment for it. Um, <laughs> so like, the whole book to me from the beginning to the ending like um there's this understanding that these kids lives probably are not going to end up like as good as happy as successful um for a lot of reasons but m the majority of them circumstance right um but they're not going to end up as happy whatever that means to you um as the adult lives they see around them um, and from the jump, I think there's just kind of this sense of impending doom. Um, and it's, it's a part of the time and place they're in. But I, I'm really curious, did you ever at any point see or try and find a really happy ending? Did you, you know, the rainbow's ending for Bunny and Michael? Um, well, in a way, I fought to get to um, a happy place because I wanted at least for them to find each other again and to find some kind of like authentic human connection and love. And that was like the happiest that, 
But I think in a lot of ways, Michael's life turns out way better than he cynically thought it might when he was in high school. I mean, he gets to go to graduate school and he gets, he finds like a nice guy. And um, so in a lot of ways, I think that he does wind up with um, a pretty happy ending. And, and the world in many ways is just to him. You know, he's a smart kid and he, you know, deserves to go to college, and he gets the chance to go, and he and he's able to 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 have what everybody wants their kids to have. Um, but I do think I think especially because um, you know I'm like squarely a millennial, I think, um, and they're always saying that we killed Chili's or whatever restaurant is going out of business. Yes, finally our 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 campaign. But I'm also just so keenly aware of, I have two little boys and I'm so aware of like the extreme mess that we are leaving. And that like, I I just can't believe, (laughs) I just can't, I can't, I can't imagine. I don't know. I like had these, um, I don't even actually know if they were Jehovah's Witnesses. We didn't get to this point, but they sort of like wandered into my backyard. It was weird. I was like, you can't just go in someone's backyard. But they came in and they were like trying to talk to me about how is the end times. And I was like, listen, I'm a mom. Like everything you're pointing out. Yes, it does feel like the end times right now. Like I'll give you that much. But my whole job is to fight to make sure this is not the end. Like I can't go pray with you and be like, yep, this is the end. I have kids. Like I need to go like sign petitions and go march and try and make this not be the end. Like it can't end. And so I think that um, that feeds into both my desire for happy endings for them and my deep cynicism that such things are possible. I think both of that comes, yeah, I, I think that comes through really well, or a lot of that comes through in the novel. And I suppose, yes, I, I yeah, I can totally see some of Michael's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, speaking of time and place, too, um, I, I think we're there. Um, you've said that the novel is pretty much a fictionalized El Segundo, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Um, and you make references throughout the book to, like, really specifically placing the book in time, um, you know, it essentially starts during the second half of the Bush administration, goes through the early Obama years, and throughout it, there's really clear time markers. So I'm wondering, you know, was that important to you, situating it so specifically in place and time? Uh, well, it was an epic nightmare, um, to, be, <laughs> to be totally honest. Um, I wrote I wrote it, and I didn't think I was going to take them to being as old as they are at the end of the book. And so I started it and I had this whole timeline where it was really only like um, the last like six years. And, and so then, cause you're always trying to kind of like write, cause you know, it's going to take like at least two years, like a year for you to write it and then a year for it to get edited and published and all that. So you're always sort of setting it two years in the future and (laughs) hoping nothing too big has happened in that time. Um, and then projecting backwards. And so then I got to a certain point where I realized that I needed to follow them a little bit further into their lives. And I was like, oh crap, I have to move everything. And so then uh, the nice, the nice thing about it was that it caused me to think like, okay, well, let me be more concrete. Like what was all, what are all these years about? And sort of what was this period, um, in my, in my own life? Um, and, what do I want to say about it? And it's sort of like, you know, in some ways, I think it's like nostalgic a little bit, um, because parts of their youth overlap, and they're younger than I am, but parts of their youth overlap with my own memories of my youth. Um, And, but I, I did, I mean, I just make a lot of pop culture references, too. I didn't know that about myself as a writer until I first, like, had a Zoom call with a, someone trying to translate one of my books and just like being endlessly like, she's like, what is 90210? And I was like, oh, that is like a hard thing, I guess, to try and figure out what the Italian equivalent of that would be. Um, so I, I've i just accepted it at this point and it, it will, um, and, and I love, I don't know, I love pop culture too. Um, and so I had actually a lot of fun like figuring out what was happening and what music would they be listening to and um it's also one of the things that 
weirded me out looking back is like that divide. It feels like I've always had a smartphone. I know that I didn't. Like I know I didn't even have any kind of cell phone for ages, but it going back and actually trying to piece out when did all that happen? How did it happen that now we all have these things and they're such a part of our lives? Because it's really like pretty recent. Yeah, even the technology, there's a moment, you know, where Michael's driving Bunny's Jeep with the iPod plugged into the adapter. And I'm like, that mm-hmm. is such a specific three year window. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, I think too, you touched on this too, about taking them through a whole lot of years. Um, and I feel like all of your books do this in a really, really wonderful way um, that the stories feel so big in scope. I think that's... Um, Girls from Corona Del Mar stretches over decades, you know, uh, well, you know, I'm not, you know, everyone else, I guess I'm saying, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I guess this, the center of the story, you know, the big chunks of this story take place over a handful of years, but you stretch them and we see so much of their lives. Um, and even in, um, Dear Fang with Love, we go back in history and everything. Um, so are you always setting out, I'm curious, uh, do you think about the scope of this like life stories? Because to me, that's what it feels like in the best ways. Like, I feel like I've lived their lives with them. I think that that is what my true interest in fiction is, is trying to understand people, how they got to be the, the way that they are. And so that does always mean that I wind up going either backwards or, or forwards um, in order to see more of them. And I think it's also part of why I tend to write about friendship because um, the lack of any kind of sort of economy in that relationship, the la- like y- you wind up being friends with someone for a long time and you wind up kind of knowing them almost like they're a character in a novel that you've been reading from the time you were young together and, and you get this sort of like accumulated layered effect of all the people they've been in the years that you've known them and I guess that's what I find like most interesting and that I get personally most obsessed with is trying to um I don't know I always like so I keep like a notebook when I'm trying to figure out characters in a book that's really just sort of questions and I don't even always answer them sometimes just asking the question is enough that then I spend the rest of the day sort of thinking about it and um I think that and what was their mom like is maybe my like most asked query I'm like it's like I'm I'm determined to take like everything back like generations I'm like well and she was probably like this because I bet her mom was like this and um I I mean I just love it and I love hearing about people's families I'm always like tell me about your parents um I just find it endlessly fascinating that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, speaking of friendships, too, I love that, fam- you know, the familial bonds in the story are all frayed in some way, one way or another. Um, and yet, the, you know, the, and the friendships get strained and they get pushed and pulled. Um, what was so specific and fascinating about writing the friendship in this book specifically? Um, and the friendship, too, I think we could talk maybe about the friendship versus the love interests that are also for so much of the book, you know, taboo in different ways and how that affects it. Yeah, I mean, there is, I think one of the things that I got to do in this book, I mean, part of the reason that I like the pairing of like a young gay man and a like quasi straight, I mean, um, woman was that there wouldn't be any question about it. And that would allow them to have that full intimacy without it turning into a will they won't they kind of a situation and I feel like one of the things that's so magical about high school is your friendship it's before you have love interests it's before you have lovers that you share everything with and so your friends are the people that you have these first profound intimate relationships with um and I I really wanted to kind of paint that portrait with them and and so there's a lot of, I mean, they both sort of discover that they have this, that both of their households that they grew up in were kind of abusive in different ways. And, and it's this weird secret world that they can kind of compare and be like, well, in my house, it was like this. How were your, were your parents? And so they, you, you know, you find out 
what somebody else's house is like. I think I'm also just so obsessed with houses and I always have been as like these like shells and these settings where these dynamics kind of play out. Um, and I didn't consciously make um, Ray a real estate agent because of that. But then once I'd done it, I was like, ooh, houses, all these different houses that they all have to live inside. Um, and so I think um, those are sort of the main things that I was thinking about with their friendship. I also just wanted somebody that didn't have, um, like I wanted somebody who could see her really clearly um, and not bring a lot of baggage to the table. Um, and so he has like a, a nice um, lack of bias in certain ways that's unusual and that lets him be um, both like cl clear sighted about her and to like love the things about her that are not obvious. Um, yeah. um, the houses just made me think of another thing I, I, I've noticed throughout all of your books and especially in this one is you're the master of writing like the hangout scene, right? Which is <laughs> ostensibly where no one's, you know, it's like we're hanging around, we're just kind of bullshitting. And then it just swings wildly in your conversations into a huge moment and kind of a, a, at times like life changing or scene changing. Um, uh, other hangout scenes you love or in the book? Oh, I mean, I think my favorite scene in the book, and I'm not saying like the best scene or something because who can say that about their own work, but the one that I enjoyed writing the most is um, where Ray Lampert comes and he's gotten surprise plastic surgery. And um, so <laughs> he's just, his face is horribly mutilated and swollen and, um, and uh, trying to, and then they, but they wind up having like, they've been having this kind of dark tense time and then he comes and it, there's, and then they wind up having like a really good time for a little while and then it turns and, that, that whole scene, like, of him, you know, ripping his stitches from laughing and trying to blot them with, you know, Domino's napkins was maybe my favorite to write. Yeah, it is golden. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I had something else. Where did it go? Where did it go? I do. I have one or two more things, and then we'll turn it over for questions, everybody. So if you want to start dropping those in the chat, go for it, and I'll get to them. Um, oh, that did kind of answer my question. It's in here somewhere. Um, well, isn't this embarrassing? <laughs> no, oh. it's not. Yeah, here it is. And it's kind of something you've touched on. I think you've talked about it a lot. Um, is that writing teenagers, you know, and all of your novels are about teenagers or, you know, have teenagers, very central figures. Um, and it's, you know, obviously this pivotal point in life. But one thing I'm curious about in writing that, I, the thing I love about your writing teenagers in all of the books, and especially this one is kind of the, the it's the tops of it, is how you catch them, teenagers who are just totally clear-eyed, calling out hypocrisy around them, um, and then the conflict between them and the adults who've just been beaten down by life, who are just like, kid, you're absolutely right. And you're also about to self-destruct. Um, is that something you're thinking about? Is that um, a conflict you're directly trying to write into? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like there's a couple different answers. I mean, one, I think that I tend to focus on like the opening acts of people's lives because um, I, I feel like now maybe my kids are five and eight and I feel like now I could write like a good novel about um, like those mommy years. But when, especially when I was starting out, I, what I knew about was being a teenager and an early 20 something. That was like the period I had the most distance from and felt like I could actually say something intelligent about. Um, in this particular book, the adults, I mean, I just feel like I've known so many, many Ray Lamperts in my life. Um, people have asked me, like, is it based off one character? I'm like, how could there be only one? I've like met like a dozen men like this. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I think Aunt Dee Dee, I'm really interested. I feel like a lot of times 
one's relationship to not just parents, but um, adult caretakers, or maybe it happens in every relationship is that even when they're really well-intentioned, sometimes they just wind up really letting you down. And um, Aunt Dee Dee really is trying very, I mean, she's got a lot going on and she's trying her best by Michael. And um, she's like very well-intentioned and yet she winds up just really not getting him in these kind of crucial ways and, and not knowing how to be there for him. Um, and so I definitely feel like that is um, part of growing up is, I mean, I think a huge part of those teenage years really is realizing that the adults don't know what they're doing um, and that they're deeply flawed and that like they're not steering the ship. You're going to have to steer. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. And I think it's fascinating the way you play with that. And, you know, the, then the big questions of morality as these teenagers are aging into them. I think it's real, especially in this book, which is really fascinating. Um, I am going to turn it over. We've got a few questions coming in the chat here. Um, I, I know we had one other bookseller who asked me um, to say, he said, please ask Rufy what research she did on head trauma and comas. Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, so, okay, um, my husband is a neuroscientist um, who studies concussion. And so, I mean, or he doesn't, that's not just what he studies, but his work involves that. And so I'm very aware of traumatic brain injury because of that. And also maybe just, I think it's like a deep, like moral conflict for him in terms of how much he loves football and how like, absolutely devastating it is um to no matter I mean I think he's at the point where he would never let our kids play football and yet he played football and loved it and it was like made all these formative relationships and, and friendships and felt like he learned to be on a team and it was great so um that I think is probably part of why I was so interested in it the coma stuff I mean I knew I, I just started I was like well what is it like and um, so I just started reading people's accounts of having been in comas and having head trauma. And it seems so scary. Like it gets really surreal. And because your brain is confabulating and putting together the things, trying to make sense of what's happening. And so even once you're awake, um, it, a lot of dream logic is still how your brain is kind of putting things together. Um, and it's just, it's fascinating to me. Yeah. There's an incredible scene, by the way, in the book of kind of that dream logic when one of the characters has had, you know, violence happen and is in the hospital for a few days and just the connections that are sort of being made with what's happening. Yeah, that's um, and how into like I I've reread that scene a couple of times and I'm still, you know, like feel stuck inside of it. What is real with it? So kudos. Awesome. Um, <laughs> So I, a question from Jason, this is a quasi-generic question, but I'd love to know your thoughts on what it was like publishing a novel in the early days of a global pandemic. Oh, well, I mean, I think that in a lot of ways, I was really lucky. Like I knew authors whose debuts were coming out and who wanted desperately that moment to stand up in front of family and friends and have their first reading and have those things that were going to mean that now they were a real writer and and they didn't get to have that. And that was so sad for me. It was my third book. And um, so it wasn't, I didn't have like a huge emotional investment in um, the in-person stuff. But what was amazing was just how generous and kind and miraculous. I mean, booksellers were having to all of a sudden shift their entire business and, and onto online and, and figuring out how to have these online events and these online presences. And there was so much energy and panic and just goodwill and kindness. Bookstagrammers were watching it happen and realizing like, oh my God, all these books are gonna go under. Like no one's gonna read them. Like, what can we do? And we're so generous at like offering to feature the book and let me take over their feeds and um, let me tell them about other books I knew about that maybe should get attention. And, and so it was this, um, time of just everyone, I feel like I made so many more connections, so many more human connections than I would have if it was a tour, just 
planned out by my publicist, you know, where I just like show up and, and do my deal. Um, and so I feel very lucky. And also I got to do so many events that I would never have gotten to do because we weren't physically proximate and I wasn't going to be going to that city. You know, I got to do an event with Kevin Wilson and Amy Bender, both of whom I'm like wild fans of. It was like a dream event for me, but I'm never going to be in Tennessee. You know what I mean? And so that part, the internet makes all these um, pairings and conversations that wouldn't have been possible suddenly happen. And that has felt really magic. So I feel like I, I got off easy of what it was really kind of a devastating situation for the industry in large. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, we, I mean, we feel like we've been super lucky to be able to put this night together too. It's for, yeah. Um, this seems like the time also for me to drop the uh, link into the chat. Since we're talking about booksellers, we are a bookseller and I'll be a bookseller for just a second. You can snag your copy of The Knockout Queen from Boswell. Another question, this one from Dave, what are some of your favorite books of the year? Speaking of bringing to the oh, other wow. books that came out this year it's it, yeah and it feels yeah. like it's been, as a bookseller it's been a really good year for fiction it, with everything else that's going on like a bunch of amazing books came out so please. yeah there has been well I mean the one that I was trying that that I just read and really was astonished by was Want by Lynn um, Strong and uh, it it's one of those books where I was reading it and I was like I'm not going to be able to forget certain moments in this book. Like, I don't think I've ever read a book exactly like this. And it's so, um, like, it feels like someone got too drunk at a party and then just, like, grabbed you and told you their whole life in, like, 20 minutes. It's a slender, like, incredibly intense book that is um, sort of interrogating, like, the complicated relationship that women have with their own desire and the extent to which like early motherhood requires this self-abnegation that can then be like um, very confusing and hard to navigate. And so it also just like has so much lactation in it. And I feel like lactation is underrepresented in fiction and there should just be way more just breast milk everywhere. Um, and <laughs> and I'm trying to think the other books. The other book that I really loved was um, The Roxy Letters by Mary Pauline Lowry. If you're looking for something light, which, because the world is so, so, so dark right now. Um, and so it's like a romantic comedy. It's sort of like Bridget Jones' diary for, but it has like, you know, crystals and witchcraft and like um, loving your vagina. And it's like very, very silly and lighthearted and very funny all necessary things yes yeah, absolutely um well and dave asked to um maybe just name some of your favorite authors in general or influential authors that's always good. okay well i mean i feel like um the last 40 years there are these sort of towering um american female novelists they're not just american really but I, I grew up and came of age reading all of them and i can still remember um like feeling this conflict because I was supposed to read Ulysses, but I had a new Louise Erdrich. <laughs> and, and I, I, it, I, I want, I realized that I wanted to write like that. Like I wanted to write things that were profound and meaningful and moving, but also so much fun. And so um, I think Louise Erdrich, uh, Jane Smiley, like a huge influence on me, even though our writing is not really alike, but her characterization, and she's so, it's just so interesting to me from an authorly perspective because she's so wide ranging in the kinds of projects that she takes on. Um, and yet there's certain things that she like does over and over. Like she's so interested in like large groups of people. Um, whereas I feel like absolutely unable to talk, <laughs> to talk about that. Um, but, um, and so then like Ann Patchett, Ann Packer, um gosh the, who else there's like so many elizabeth strout um karen joy fowler um there's just they're the the women that i love to read they're the books that i can't that whenever they have a new one that's what i'm going to go buy um and i think that they've been really influential i think like maybe one of the most um formative things for me was probably john irving um, I really 
it took me a long time to understand that I was a comedic novelist because I, I'm also drawn to really dark themes. And I mean, I didn't write anything funny. I remember being in graduate school for fiction writing and one of my classmates saying, it's so weird um, that your work isn't funny at all because you're a very like funny person and very jokey. Um, and I was like, it, it just never occurred to me to try to be funny <laughs> in my work. And so then I was like, oh, like maybe that's a, a way. And because I have, I think, a very melodramatic imagination and um, the humor kind of leavens it so that um, suddenly like it's not just all of this darkness, but it kind of can, can rise and become a true cake. Um, and so I think that I learned a lot about how to do that from John Irving and from, I mean, like, he's like, and now I'm going to write a funny book about abortion. And, and, and you're like, how? And he's like, at an orphanage. <laughs> and you're like, what? And so, um, I, and I, I love that. And I also just like, I love that um, not all his books are good. I find that very comforting. Um, and then it's, there's not like a progression, like it's like, boop, 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 like they're all over. And I feel like you have to give yourself that permission as a novelist to sometimes go on fool's errands or start digging in a place where there really isn't that much there. I don't know. I just, I admire him tremendously. Well, and then I think the next question for me is what are you working on? If anything, is anything happening? Oh, yeah, I mean, yes and no. I started writing something and um, I wrote about like the first third of it. And so what I normally do is I will write like kind of act one, like the opening or premise of a book and write it over and over and over, rewriting it until I understand who the characters are and kind of find all their voices and figure it out. And then I'll go and more carefully plot out how the rest of it's going to go and then write from there. And so this first act, I'm just really on the fence of whether or not I'm going to finish it. Um, but it's about, it's about a girl who's making her living from OnlyFans, um, which like, I, I don't know how, my agent didn't know what OnlyFans was and I had to explain it to her, but um, it's basically like, um, like very mild sex work, um, like paid Instagram accounts kind of. Um, and she winds up having this kind of like very intense but non-sexual but yet romantic relationship with one of her fans who is um, like a data scientist who does all these deep learning algorithms and um, winds up, together they wind up inventing all of these girls and they run all these accounts and that's like how they make money um, is by <clears throat> trying to figure out what people want and what people are falling in love with and what like breaking people down into different kinds of like types and, and um, what they find appealing and then fabricating the girls themselves. Um, and I'm like super interested in AI. And, and of course the whole thing is about writing fiction. And, and it's, so it's, I mean, they're creating fiction in the same way that I do. And so it's like a little, maybe a little too meta. I don't know. I don't know yet, but I do really like the characters. So maybe I'll do, I, I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like OnlyFans is definitely something, one of those things that if you're like medium to very online, you're, you've been aware of like this exists. Um, yeah. But if you're not super online, uh, so are you super online? And is it like- I mean, I, I would aspire to be super online, but I don't think that I'm fully super online. I'm like always a little bit late to the party. I, of all the platforms, Twitter is the only one that I got super comfortable on. I think just because like, it's such a, you know, a shit show um, <laughs> and, and it's so chaotic and terrible. And I was like, ah, I understand this. Um, and so I do go on there a fair amount. Enough. Fair enough. Does it affect your writing at all? Do you think being online? I'm sure. How could it not? Um, I mean, it definitely. I, I think I said. You know what really affects my, my writing and my sense of reality is like how much time I spend playing Fortnite with my kids, and like how much time I, <laughs> you know, spend like endlessly like doing Minecraft with them, and and I 
think that it has made me very curious about how um, like culture is going to continue to evolve. I'm really fascinated by it and interested and, and I don't, um, I'm working in such an old medium, you know, and so I'm very interested in all these young new baby mediums and what are you gonna be able to say in them? Um, and I don't, I feel like, I know there's all sorts of like death of the novel, like people get freaked out about it like every 10 years and I don't think it's going anywhere. There's, but, and I, I've never had that anxiety about it um, in the same way that I think like, I don't know, like the, the opera is sort of like, become, there's less and less like young opera fans and this kind of thing. But I do think that the box you're using very much determines what you can put in there. And so as these like new, I wasn't interested in video games until I started playing them. And then I'm like, oh, this is like a very different way of, of making fake things, which is, you know, what I do. Um, so in that, in that sense, I think it very much shapes my writing. Interesting, interesting, yeah. Well, I think we have, let me, let me ask you quickly, Jane wants to know, the book called Want, can you tell, repeat the author's name? Um, it's Lynn, and then her last name is Strong, like, ugh. Perfect. Um, and then I think we're getting about to that time. So I've got one general question here, a, a pandemic question that I think will give us a chance for a, for a nice takeout here. But Kevin wants to know, what have you rediscovered or fallen in love with during the pandemic? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean... There has been, I think, especially in the summer, there was this formlessness where, I mean, just trying to make the day have any shape. And I'm basically just like playing with two very weird little boys all day. And so we like alternate <laughs> playing video games, bouncing on the trampoline and going in. We got like an inflatable hot tub from good old walmart.com. And because we're, we're like, we're here, we're stuck here, we might as well, and we are lucky enough to have a backyard. Um, and so I feel like it, in a weird way, has returned me to a younger conscious, I felt very much, I've, I feel more in touch with my teenage self than I have in a really long time. Um, and I think some of it is from just being, because I was, I was 16 and I had just moved to New York City two weeks before 9-11 happened. And there was this like feeling at that time, like things, big things were changing in the world and that um, everything was not exactly how, how people had been thinking of it. And I felt that way again as the pandemic was starting. And then I've spent all my time in completely puerile pursuits. Um, and so <laughs> I think that that is maybe what I've rediscovered is how to just like, you know, fritter away hours trash talking a five-year-old and murdering them over and over. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> this seems like the perfect generation for yet another perfect like hangout scene in the next book too. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you so much for to, uh, joining me tonight. This has been Super special for me. Once again, everyone, Rufy Thorpe, thank you. Favorite book of the year. Can't say enough good things about it. Um, thank you, everyone else, for tuning in. This has been a wonderful evening. Um, from Boswell, we say thank you because we wouldn't have a bookstore um, on Downer Avenue or here on the internet without you. Have a great evening, all. Bye. Thank you so much for having me.